Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 63. Before we get into today's questions, big thanks as usual to our sponsors. First we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Precision Hydration make electrolyte products in various different sodium and electrolyte concentrations so that you can match the right product to your individual sweat sodium content. Because the thing is that there are great individual variances in how much sodium you lose in your sweat compared to how much your body loses in his or her sweat. So somebody might be losing up to 2000 milligrams per liter and somebody else might be as low as lower than 500 or even down towards 200 milligrams so almost a tenfold uh, variation there between individual to individual and if you are somebody who loses a lot in particular then that's a reason to go and check out precision hydration and find out more about how electrolyte supplementation during training and racing can help you perform better you can Try your first box or tube of uh, electrolytes for free with the promo code that triathlon show all on word on precisionhydration.com. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits, tri suits, swimskins, goggles, and high performance eyewear. I use plenty of their products personally and I really love them. Among others, I use uh, the Maverick X wetsuit, the R1 goggles, and uh, the Gen 2 Elite Aero Tri suit. And uh, these are just uh, a sample of the products that I think are absolutely fantastic. If you are looking for anything in the categories mentioned, definitely give them a look. And Roka products might be a great uh, tip for Christmas gifts for uh, some of your triathlon family members or friends that uh, want quality products of any of the aforementioned categories. Especially considering you can get 20% off your order with the promo code TTS, all caps. So let's get into today's questions. First we have uh, Rusty in the United States who writes... Thank you for another great podcast in episode 209 on injury prevention and rehabilitation. I was thinking about trying to eat roughly 2 grams of protein per 1 kilogram of body weight, as James mentioned in the interview. At 75 kilograms, that would be 150 grams of protein per day. If we can only absorb around 30 grams of protein per meal, that would be 5 meals a day with 30 grams of protein per meal. That seems difficult to obtain. Also, how much does training load affect that protein requirement as I personally train around 10 hours per week. Keep up the great work. All right, thank you for your question, Rusty. Uh, This is a great question. Uh, The first angle that I want to tackle this from is uh, to discover how much protein can we actually use in a single meal? And uh, I'm going to cite a study here, a recent one from one of the uh, foremost experts in the field, which is Brad Schoenfeld in 2018, who published a study called, or a review called How Much Protein Can the Body Use in a Single Meal for Muscle Building? Implications for Daily Protein Distribution. I will link to this in the episode description, of course. And uh, in this study, the purpose was to review the literature and uh, determine if there is an upper threshold for protein intake per meal. And then based on that, they wanted to draw any relevant conclusions uh, to for guidelines for per meal protein distribution to optimize uh, lean tissue uh, building. And uh, what they say here, conclude in the study, is that based on the current evidence, the maximum to maximize an- anabolism, one should consume protein at a target intake of 0.4 grams per kilogram per meal across a minimum of four meals in order to reach a minimum of 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight per day. Using the upper daily intake of 2.2 grams per kilogram per day reported in the literature spread out over the same four meals would uh, necessitate a maximum of 0.55 grams per kilo- kilogram body weight per meal. They also write here that uh, while research shows that consumption of higher protein doses, uh, in other words, larger than 20 grams, results in greater amino acid oxidation, 
Evidence indicates that this is not the fate for all the additional ingested amino acids, as some are utilized for tissue building purposes. Further research is nevertheless needed to quantify a specific upper threshold for per meal protein intake. So to comment here, uh, just what, uh, what they summarized here in the study, we don't really know exactly what the upper limit is. We know that if we go higher than 20 grams, we won't use all the additional protein for tissue building necessarily, but we'll still use uh, a fair amount of it. So that leads us to the situation that yes, some of the protein content, if you intake, let's say 40 grams per meal, uh, is not going to be used for tissue building, at least probably it will not, but uh, you will still have more protein available for tissue building if you intake 40 grams in a meal compared to 20 grams in a meal. And an important thing to mention in this context that is mentioned in the review, uh, I won't read the passage, but just my summary of it, what kind of protein you consume does matter here. For example, they mentioned an example of cooked egg protein having an absorption rate of 3 grams per hour. Uh, so the complete absorption of an omelette containing the same 20 grams of protein as whey protein uh, would take seven full hours, which is much faster than the whey, much slower, sorry, much slower than the whey protein absorption, which might be, I can't recall, but maybe one hour. And they comment that this omelette and the slower absorption can attenuate oxidation of amino acids and therefore promote greater whole body net positive protein balance. In other words, it's not always necessary to get the fastest absorbing protein into you. Actually getting a slower absorbing protein might be better if you are focused on actually getting to use all of that protein. So maybe if you are relying heavily on supplementation, then you need to get more protein because you need to be aware that some of it is going to be just oxidized and not used for, uh, for muscle protein synthesis. So... Uh, what I would say here is that uh, the takeaway message from that specifically is that you should get most of your protein from whole food sources, even though supplementation can be good and for some athletes even required. I think that at 10 hours of training per week, as protein supplementation is not required. I think that it's easy enough to get all of your protein from whole foods. Now, that being said, uh, your suggested five times 30 grams of protein per day uh, sounds like a, a very good starting point, especially for a 75 kilogram athlete uh, like yourself with 10 hours of training per week. Uh, so let's look at your first at your metabolism and your caloric needs in general. So if you're training 10 hours per week, that is roughly one and a half hours per day on average, meaning that you probably use between 700 and 1200 calories per day for your workouts depending on the intensity of the workouts and your ability we need to add your basal metabolic rate and let's just for simplicity estimate that it's 2000 calories that means that you might need to consume close to 3000 calories per day on average and we're doing a lot of estimates here and uh, back of the napkin calculations it's easy for you to, to get some better estimates, although you won't get an exact answer, but better estimates yourself uh, through various calculators, etc. 150 grams of protein, which is uh, what your 5 times 30 gram suggestion equals, that turns out to be 600 calories. 1 gram of protein is 4 calories. So uh, 600 calories out of 3,000 is 20%, meaning 20% of your energy would be derived from pr protein. And this falls right in line with recommendations. It's certainly not too much. Uh, even if I would have overestimated your average daily caloric expenditure, let's say that you might be 2,700 or 2,800, 600 calories of protein divided by 2,700 or 2,800 might get you up to 25% or so. And that's still totally fine. It's not overdoing it on the protein at all. So that 5 times 30 gram is actually right in the right ballpark. To give you an example of what this might look like, uh, this is how I might do it for 5 times 30 grams of protein. So these are examples of the kind of protein sources that I rely on and something that actually would be very typical for me to have during a day. So for breakfast, you could have two eggs, one cup of cooked oatmeal, 
and uh, 100 grams of quark, which is a yogurt alternative that I eat a lot, which is very rich in protein, and I really like it. It's very healthy. If you eat dairy products, then that's a great recommendation for uh, both the, uh, the vitamins and minerals in dairy products, but also, of course, the high protein content. For lunch, I might have 100 grams of quinoa and one can of tuna. And for dinner, one chicken breast. So those would be the the three main meal protein sources. And uh, most of them end up being around 30 grams. The chicken breast is more than 30 grams. It's probably 40 grams. And uh, two snacks we would need to add to this, of course. So one snack might be 200 grams of cottage cheese, which really is a staple snack for me. Very healthy, tons of protein. So really like that as a source, regular source of protein. And the second snack, depending on if you supplement with protein or not, it might be a post-workout recovery shake that contains that 30 grams of protein, or it might be some whole food alternative, one of the some of the ones that we mentioned above, or something entirely different. So uh, that ends up being your five times 30 gram in fairly equal spread. The chicken breast is the only one that is a bit higher, and some of the other ones end up being maybe 25 grams rather than 30 grams. I did do the calculations to verify when I was preparing this episode. So most of them end up being very close to to 30 grams. There are, of course, many, many, many ways. And this is just one example of countless for how to get your 30 grams of protein. You don't have to eat meat or dairy or even fish to get your protein content. There are great sources of protein like quinoa, lentils, beans, peas, and oatmeal that uh, contain significant amounts of protein outside of... uh, of meat, dairy, and fish. So, uh, so yeah, it's quite possible even for for vegetarians and vegans to to get the right amount of protein. Training load does have an impact on how much protein you should consume, because unless you want to gain or lose weight, you need to balance the energy equation. Uh, energy equation: calories in should equal calories out. So, if your training load is significantly smaller. Let's say that your average daily target of calories might be 2,400 calories to stay in energy balance. Then actually at that level, you could still maintain the same 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. That would still be the same 600 calories. And uh, what you do then is simply to reduce the amounts of calories you get from fats and carbohydrates to compensate, which is okay to do. So maybe instead of having around five to six grams of carbohydrates per kilogram body weight per day you go down to three to four grams per carbs per kilogram body weight per day and the four grams for as an example would mean 300 grams of carbohydrates and that would mean 1200 calories one gram of carbohydrate equals four calories so you would get 50 percent of your energy from carbs 25 percent from protein and then the rest 25 percent from fat uh, but of course, protein needs they decrease with the decreased training load. So you could you don't necessarily have to be at two grams per kilogram if you are training much less. Let's say if you're training six to seven hours per week, you would uh, probably be perfectly fine on one point five grams of protein per kilogram body weight. I don't see any reason why why that would wouldn't be enough. Let's do one more example here, and uh, let's use a female athlete with even lower caloric needs. Let's say that this athlete is training for one hour per day, so perhaps their caloric goal is 2,000 calories per day. If this athlete weighs 50 kilograms, then 2 grams per kilogram body weight is actually a very realistic target, uh, because that's still just 100 grams of protein, equaling 400 calories from protein, which is 20% of their 2,000 calories per day, which could they could get, for example, in four uh, servings of 25 grams of protein. If, on the other hand, we have a, we're dealing with a heavier athlete, let's say they, their weight is 65 kilograms, uh, then we can go to, for example, 125 grams of protein for a day, which equals 500 calories from protein, which is 25% of their daily caloric needs, which is still very realistic. And uh, they end up getting 1.9 grams per kilogram body weight, despite, again, this overall caloric need being down to 2,000 calories, so significantly lower than uh, what uh, your caloric need would be, Rusty, at uh, training 10 hours per week and a 75-kilogram male on top of that. 
And going back to the example here, this uh, 65 kilogram female athlete having 125 grams of protein per day, equaling 500 calories from protein, they still have 1500 calories to make use of for carbohydrate and fat. There are no super big carbohydrate needs at this low training volume, so it's very easy to complete the the daily menu as we did above because simply they you can you don't need any more than three to four uh, grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight. So so it's very easy to complete that menu and get a nice balanced healthy diet. So to sum up, it really isn't that difficult, but it may be a big change in your normal nutrition habits. But do some easy calculations and establish a daily routine. That is where I would recommend you start. And uh, this won't be very challenging at all. It will just take a little bit of time to make it second nature. Hope that this answers your question. The second question from today for today is from Petri in Finland who writes, uh, What equipment is it worth getting for home-based strength and conditioning? And what exercises are worth doing at home? I use your strength training plan, but I don't have time to go to the gym two times per week. So far, I have gone to the gym when I can, and at home I have done the core stability and plyometric exercises once per week. Uh, There is a second part of the question, but I'll answer this part first. So thank you, Petri, for your question. Uh, This is a really good question and very relevant for for anybody uh, using my or other strength and conditioning plans, but that may not have the ability or the possibility to go to the gym as often as they would like Uh, it is the good news here is that it's very possible to make a very effective home-based strength and conditioning routine with quite minimalistic equipment really the first thing that you should get are some kettlebells ideally i would recommend getting four kilo four kettlebells of four kilograms eight kilograms 12 kilograms and 16 kilograms But if you were to choose only two, then I would go for 8 kilograms and 12 kilograms. And uh, that would be really good. A really good starting point, at least. The second piece of equipment that I really recommend is the stability ball. That is uh, a very versatile piece of equipment for a variety of different kinds of exercises. And the third one is uh, elastic bands of a few different resistances. Usually you get like a package with a light, medium and a hard band and it might cost cost you 10 to 20 euros not more than that so it's very affordable and you get three different bands to use for different exercises again these are great versatile pieces of equipment that you can that you can do use for a lot of different exercises to make them more effective then a yoga mat or something similar a mat to do the the workouts on obviously is pretty important and uh, i would also say a foam roller because we're talking strength and conditioning so the foam rolling would be part of that conditioning i would say that that's that's something that is worth getting for sure even if it's not a mandatory part of the strength training plan but i do recommend using a foam roller a bit during the warm-up if you are on a budget then i would uh, make some space to train in front of a mirror that you already have at home at least for those exercises that require it which would mostly be the exercises that you do with kettlebells like goblet squats and kettlebell swings etc but if you prefer and if you have the the budget and the space then a bonus piece of equipment worth investing in would be a tall mirror so that you can set it up in your in your strength training area of your house or apartment and then you can watch yourself and check your form and uh, that's it you could get more stuff that that wouldn't be very expensive at all or take up a lot of space but uh, there's no need i would say that these are really the essentials so it's not a whole lot and probably you already have half of these things anyway like a yoga mat or strength training mat and a foam roller uh, I think very few triathletes don't already have these things at home. And even stability balls and bands are very common in triathletes' homes. So I think that the kettlebells and the mirror are the, the two main things that, that you might want to invest in. And as for the second question about what exercise you do at home, you can adapt any exercise really for home use as long as you have kettlebells. So actually, I would uh, advise you to consider that if you can't get to the gym very regularly, then it might be worth investing in in those four kettlebells that I mentioned uh, so that you have a few different weights or several different weights to optimize your home gym environment because then what you might be able to do is to 
just cancel your gym membership and you will be saving money. You will have, have that initial startup investment of the kettlebells and uh, a mirror maybe and some other equipment. But after that, you'll be, after a few months, you will be breaking even and then saving money every month. So that might be worth considering because if you can be more consistent with your strength training at home, then you really have everything you need to get 80% or more of the benefits of going to the gym. The one thing that I would say is that if you are to do this, then the mirror really is an essential piece of equipment. You can't skip the mirror in this case. If you are going to go to the gym every now and then, then you might you might get by with not getting a mirror because you can always check your form when you are going to the gym to do your gym workouts. But if you are going to be doing only home-based strength training, then you really should have that mirror because form is so essential to getting the most out of your strength training. So you have to be able to review your form regularly, even if it's not every single workout. So unless you you get that mirror at home, then I would say that you should keep going to the gym every now and then to, to have the ability to, to check your form in the mirror that most gyms have. As for how to adjust, what exercises to do and, and how to adjust a gym-based plan to a home-based plan, let's take my strength training plan that you are already using as an example. And what I'll do here is to just list the exercises included in uh, the first workout of the plan, and I'll tell you how to adjust them for your home environment. If they need adjustment, some of them won't need any adjustment at all. They will just be the same. So we have two parts of the of the workout. We have a core training set and we have a weight training, uh, weightlifting set. So in the weightlifting set, which is sort of you could you might call it the main set of the workout, we have in this exercise the barbell squat, and that can be replaced by the goblet squat with kettlebells. We have the Romanian deadlift, which can be replaced with kettlebell swings. And we have the lat pull down, which can be replaced with a kettlebell row. So what we have do done here is that we have uh, three main movements. We have the squat, we have the hinge, and we have the pull. And we have replaced them with exercises that are also a squat, a hinge, and a pull, but using kettlebells instead of the, the barbell and or the lat pull down bar that we would be using in the gym. So we're still training the same movements, the same or the same main movement patterns and the same main muscle groups, just with in slightly different ways. In the core training set, the exercises we have there includes the stability ball, Spider-Man plank that works on anti-rotation and anti-extension. We have the side plank with leg raises, and that movement works on anti-flexion and your adductors. And for this one, you may use your bands, uh, but you also can get away with not using your bands. So uh, either way, whatever is challenging enough for you. Then we have the single leg glute bridge, and for that one, you may or you may choose to use the stability ball or not. And that's an exercise that works on your glutes and your posterior chain activation, and also on anti-extension. And finally, the final set here is, or final exercise, is the crab walk, which uh, does use bands. Uh, so in this one, you have to use bands. In all the other ones, you had to use the stability ball in the Spider-Man plank, but the two other exercises, you could use bands or a stability ball, but you could also choose to do them without equipment. And the crab walk here works the glutes, the hips, and the, and the AB adductors. And some general advice here when it comes to uh, to exchanging one exercise for another that you can do with your equipment uh, that you have available at home, go to bodybuilding.com and to their exercise database. If you have an exercise prescribed in whatever program you're using that is working, for example, on your hamstrings and you can't do that at home, just look up the hamstring exercise library and see which exercises for the hamstrings are doable with the equipment that you have available at home. Or you can do it the other way. You can you know that you have a press pressing exercise, for example, like the bench press. Then just search for press, and you'll find find a number of options that work the the main movement that is the press. Uh, same goes for push exercises and squat, hinge, and pull exercises. Uh, those are the five main types of exercises that you will do: the push, push, pull, squat, hinge, and press. And you can find versions of each that are very conducive for home based strength training. So to answer your question specifically on what exercises to do at home, 
since you have my plan already, use that plan as your baseline and just find the alternative exercises that uh, you can do at home based on your equipment and the principles just described. And uh, for those listeners that do not have a strength training plan, uh, just some quick advice. You should be doing each of the main five movements, uh, the push, pull, squat, hinge, and press in your training program. That doesn't mean that you should be doing them in equal amounts. Personally, I tend to gravitate towards uh, prescribing the squat, the hinge, and the pull as the most important ones for triathletes just as long as you don't completely neglect the press and the push either. You need a little bit of that to to keep balanced. And then you need uh, some core exercises that target anti-extension, anti-rotation, and anti-flexion. And probably also some posterior chain activation exercises. That's uh, how I've designed my strength training program. And uh, generally speaking, I think that's a good approach. My strong recommendation is uh, that unless you already have a coach that prescribes strength and conditioning for you, then get a well-thought-out strength and conditioning plan and adjust as needed using the principles above and the recommended equipment for your home-based strength training. The second question that Petri has is, what are your five most essential books for the self-coached triathlete? So this was a fun question as it allowed me to first make a list and then go back and compare to episode 125 that I recorded over one and a half years ago, which is called Top 10 Books, Blogs and Resources for Triathletes. And I'll link to that obviously in the episode description. Note that those resources were my favorite resources, so it's a slightly different perspective than this question because Petri asks about the most essential books for the self-coached athlete. So there is a strong overlap, but it's a slightly different perspective. And the books that I would recommend for the self-coached athlete are The Triathlete's Training Bible by Joe Friel. I did not have this actually included in my list back in episode 125, as it's not really a book that I use, although it is a great book, and it contains a lot of the fundamental principles. And every self-coached athlete needs to know these fundamental principles. And I would argue that a lot of athletes would be really well served reading or rereading this book, even though you may feel that you are too advanced for it and that you already know the fundamental principles. Because reading about them again may open up your eyes to the fact that maybe you have been been doing some mistakes or overlooking some of those principles in your training. Uh, This is something that, an impression that I get as a coach that even advanced athletes, there are some very simple fixes in in most of their training usually. So highly recommended for the self-coached athletes, the Triathletes Training Bible by Joe Friel. And if I would say that if you're only going to get or read one book as a self-coached athlete, athlete, this is probably it. The second book I would recommend is Triathlon Science, and this is co-edited by Joe Friel and Jim Vance. And uh, this was my top ranked resource and uh, still is at least one of them no matter what topic related to triathlon you want to learn more about you can find a nice overview of the subject in this book is it perfect and 100 accurate no but is it a great resource to quickly get a better grasp of pretty much any subject matter related to triathlon that you won't get necessarily in a training book like the triathlete's training bible so for example subject matters like Uh, psychology more in-depth physiology biomechanics and nutrition yes it's perfect for that and that's why i think it's well worth the investment and why i ranked it number one in episode 125 if i redid episode 125 today i might actually have inigo muyika's endurance training as my go-to science book instead of triathlon science but that is a proper textbook so i think for self-coached athletes Triathlon science is better and more practical. Uh, that Of that, I have no doubt. It is definitely the one I would recommend uh, ahead of Inigo Muyika's endurance training, as much as I like that one. The third book is uh, the Swim Smooth book. And this is really great and does a great job of balancing out three important aspects of swim training for triathletes. The technique component, the training slash fitness component, and the open water swimming component. This book has tons of great photos and illustrations for swimming drills, for example, and in particular for anybody for whom the swim is an area of improvement, 
I would say that you have to get this book. This is uh, really, really a great, great resource. And I ranked it number two in episode 125. So that goes to show that it's a, some, a book that I really value highly. The fourth book I would recommend is The Endurance Diet by Matt Fitzgerald. If you are to get a book on nutrition, this is the, the one book I would recommend. It does a great job of combining practical and scientific information. It never gets too technical. It always keeps the advice simple and actionable. And I am absolutely convinced that this book has completely changed the trajectory of countless of endurance athletes' careers by helping them getting the basics of nutrition right, which really is what 95% of us need. It's not about advanced strategies. It's about getting the basics right. And for that reason, I ranked this book number three in episode 125. And the fifth book I would recommend, it's a hard choice between two books, between How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Fitzgerald and Endure by Alex Hutchinson. Both are great books on the mental side of things, uh, but I probably would have to give the nod to How Bad Do You Want It, because I think it's slightly more practical and filled with advice, whereas Endure is my favorite book just as an enjoyable read that still packs a ton of information, but perhaps it is slightly less practical and actionable. So I would say get both, but if you get one and you're looking for a book that will help you implement some changes and improve you as an athlete, then I would probably say get How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Fitzgerald. Uh, it, it still has a great story ele- element to it, so it is a very enjoyable read. Uh, but uh, it's uh, split into different chapters that each cover, each basically ending in one particular piece of advice, which is something that Endure doesn't quite do as well. So uh, so both are great books. But again, How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Fitzgerald is probably the one that I would would have here. And that book also ranked number three in episode 125, by the way, because I actually cheated and put three Matt Fitzgerald books on that spot. And Endure, I ranked as number four in episode 125. So that's it. Uh, Thank you for your questions, Petri, and hope that this helps you and others. The final question for today is from Steve in the United States, who writes, I was involved in an old bike accident three months ago. Four out of six got hurt. I had 10 broken bones all in the upper right side of my body. The worst being the second vertebra break that could uh, could have easily paralyzed or killed me. I am now recovered except the continuing work to rehabilitate my shoulder muscles. Even though I was able to walk briskly within three weeks of my accident and, I'm, and now I'm able to be on my bike outside or trainer, I had noticed that I, I have lost so much muscle. What would be your suggestions to get that muscle back and the length of time you think it might take? All my doctors are surprised at my quick healing, even though I am 60 years old. Love your podcast and often get great ideas from it. Thanks. So, Steve, I am really sorry to hear about your crash, but I am glad that you are, uh, given the circumstances, all right. Uh, So, I'm bringing this question to the front of the queue. It came in quite recently, uh, but I want to answer it right away because this is important for not just you, but for anybody riding in with these kinds of questions. I cannot really say much else than you need to work with your doctor and your physical therapist and any other members of your support network and have them guide you through uh, the injury rehabilitation process. That's not something that... uh, anybody can do really without seeing you in person and assessing you in person and second uh, the medical doctors and physiotherapists are the ones that have the expertise to advise you here i'm a coach i'm not a doctor i'm not a physiotherapist so even if i could see you in person my advice would still still be to go and see a good medical doctor and uh, and a good physical therapist and follow their advice but uh, i have a couple of comments for you to get a general idea of the rehabilitation from injury process, definitely go back and listen to last week's interview, episode 209, Injury Prevention and Rehabilitation, with uh, James Debenham that we already mentioned earlier in this episode. That was a great, great interview uh, with content from somebody who is an actual expert in this area. James was super knowledgeable and also great at expressing and uh, explaining the information that he covered. So go back and listen to that one. And uh, some general information about how long it will take to regain muscle mass. Traditionally, we have been thought that uh, muscle hypertrophy 
might take uh, actually up to six to eight weeks before we can first start to see hypertrophy in an individual. That is what the NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, typically teaches. But these days, there are some studies that have shown that that muscle hypertrophy can start to occur as early as after two resistance training sessions. So, for example, a study by Jason De Freitas and colleagues in the European Journal of Applied Physiology measured the hypertrophy of the thigh muscles of 25 healthy sedentary men each week over an eight-week resistance training program, and they found a 3.5% increase in the cross-sectional area of the muscle after just one week of training. And across that eight-week program, the hypertrophy continued each week, so that at the end of week eight, the cross-sectional area of the muscle had uh, increased by almost 10%. And uh, important to note here is that the actual strength of the muscles increased much more than the size or mass of the muscles. So at the end of week 8, compared to the 10% size increase, there was a 23% increase in strength just from the neuromuscular improvements that took place. Since you have been out of action for three months, or not completely out of, out of action, but uh, it's three months since your injury, you may have lost slightly more muscle than that you can rebuild it 100% in eight weeks. But I think that after eight weeks, if you haven't started a resistance training program already, if you start to do a, resi- a focused resistance training program designed by a knowledgeable physiotherapist, uh, then after eight weeks, I think you will be fairly close to where you were before, assuming, again, that that program is uh, good and well designed. So I hope that this helps us some general information. And again, go and trust the advice of your medical doctor, physical therapist, and the rest of your support network. And I really hope that you recover quickly and recover well. That wraps it up for this week's Q&A. You will have plenty of links in the episode description. All the other episodes and books and stuff that have been mentioned will be there. Keep sending in questions for these Q&A episodes to michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's Michael with a K. And if you enjoy the content that you get from the podcast, then be sure to check out our website, scientifictriathlon.com. We offer ready-made training plans, individual coaching, customized training plans, and all sorts of products and services there so there is something for everybody finally thank you to our sponsors precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com go and get a free hydration plan to help you get through your next race on precisionhydration.com and get your first box or tube of electrolytes for free with the promo code that triathlon show all one word all caps and thank you to roca for sponsoring the podcast you can find them on roca.com Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, and use the promo code TTS to get 20% off your entire order. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.